And now moving forward uh, for the spotlight conversation, democracy on, on Ukraine, I invite on, this, on the stage Hannah Hopko, chair of the board and founder, Act, Navigate, Transform, Shape, and Ukraine, and Yulia Bankova, editor-in-chief, Liga.net Ukraine. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for your interest to the topic of Ukraine. Um, every time I'm nervous a bit because uh, the level of the intention is uh, getting lower, unfortunately. So thank you for being here. Uh, I want to start our conversation with Hanna from uh, latest news uh, from Ukraine. And uh, one of the uh, previous panel's topic was uh, hegemony of uh, Russia and the Black Sea. And uh, today, uh, this morning, Ukraine hit two military boats of Russian Federation. Uh, early in November, uh, Ukrainian uh, armed forces also, uh, there was an attack on the ship repair plant in Kerch. It happens again and again, and despite all of this, uh, everything, uh, ships with uh, Ukrainian grain continue to reach destinations. So the question is, uh, can we talk about hegemony of Russian uh, Federation in the Black Sea? Uh, and Ukraine has uh, shown uh, more than one time is uh, efficiency and creativity, despite the total lack of uh, uh, weapons. And when I'm thinking about democracy in Ukraine, uh, I'm thinking about the, uh, that the only thing, the only threat for democracy in Ukraine we have now is uh, Russian missiles. And I think that maybe uh, Hanna will agree with me. Um, we, uh, Hanna and me, we have known each other more than 10 years, I guess. And 10 years ago, uh, this time actually in November, uh, we stood on the Maidan during the re revolution of dignity, defending democracy and uh, insisting on signing the association agreement with EU. And uh, two days ago, European Commission recommended starting negotiations uh, on Ukrainian accessions to the European Union and uh, emphasized that despite the war, Ukraine continued to implement important re reforms. Hanna, uh, what do you think? Isn't it the best illustration that we managed to defend democracy in Ukraine? Thank you, Yulia. Uh, thank you, uh, the organizers, for having this uh, panel. Because I think uh, what is in Ukraine is uh, what at stake is the global democracy. And actually, you uh, started uh, your presentations from mentioning this successful uh, morning operation by the Ukrainian armed forces. This is the way how we demilitarize Russian presence in the Black Sea and actually uh, guarantees that the freedom of navigation and export of Ukrainian grain and agriculture commodities uh, are in place. And uh, of course, we do expect to have more attackums and also our German uh, Taurus uh, systems, which will really help us to liberate all Ukrainian territories because Russia started its invasion uh, against Ukraine in 2014 from illegal annexation of Crimea. So the um, victory means also uh, returning back Crimea because when we are talking about uh, Ukrainian uh, military operations and liberation of our territories, we are, the main focus is of course genocide what's happening in the occupied uh, territories every hour when we speak Russians armed forces are torturing, are killing uh, Ukrainians living in the occupied areas. So for us, it's of course the issue of uh, uh, human rights because uh, almost 10 years of ongoing Russian aggression uh, against Ukraine is an attack on humanity. And it's key for us. And this is why in previous panel, uh, we discussed also and we raised the issues that we want uh, to see more stronger, uh, not just statements about what Russia is doing in the Black Sea. And actually, if we analyze the situation in the South China Sea, when we have this 
for no freedom of navigation operations. We would like to see similar in the Black Sea when NATO countries demonstrate real actions, helping Ukraine with uh, export of uh, um, agricultural commodities. And um, also everyone uh, analyzing the uh, article published by uh, General Zaluzhny, it's his second analysis. Previous one was published a year ago with a call to our Western partners, give us 300 tanks for spring counteroffensive. Give us uh, uh, everything we need to demonstrate uh, a strong uh, uh, leadership in re restoring our territorial integrity and sovereignty. And I think uh, both uh, President Zelensky and uh, General Zaluzhny are sending the clear message that uh, the West need finally to wake up and actually to understand that it's not just Russia, it's also North Korea, which was uh, capable to provide more uh, munition, uh, Russia with more weapons than the global trade power, the European Union. So actually, I think uh, in the war of attrition, it's important to have this victory strategy. But victory strategy, when you have this goal of victory, then the means fall off. And means it's a more weapon, more financial resources, tougher and real sanctions that Russia will not be able to buy Western components to produce more uh, drones, uh, more uh, missiles, and keep uh, killing civilians and destroying critical energy infrastructure in, in uh, ahead of winter season. Uh, yes, it's all about defending not only our democracy, uh, but democracy in the whole world and uh, European countries, and we are heading into election seasons. And we will have, um, I guess, uh, elections in 17 countries uh, uh, very soon. And uh, support for Ukraine is very politicized. Uh, how to keep world attention in this situation? Because as I mentioned uh, earlier, it's all about uh, that on a battlefield in Ukraine, we defend not only our territories, uh, but only, but, but also democracy, right to the democracy, uh, democratic elections in European Union, in each European country. How to, to, to keep this and what do you think about uh, this very tough period for all of us of elections? Thanks for these important questions. It's really next year, 2024, elections, it seems like everywhere. In the US, in European Parliament, here in Romania, in Taiwan, and in India, in the UK, so it's really important to explain the geopolitical actuality of victory in Ukraine. Because it seems like uh, the West uh, somehow self-isolated itself from Russian uh, war against Ukraine and from the new realities that uh, anti-Western forces, it's China, Russia, Iran, North Korea, Belarus, and others, they already crafted the anti-Western world, and they try to uh, extend the, their influence and build, uh, it's a part of uh, revanchism. And uh, for me, it's really important, especially in the eve of 90th anniversary of commemoration of Holodomor as a genocide, What's happening now in Ukraine, it's genocide. And I'm thankful to those 14 countries, 14 nations, which already recognize Russian aggression as a genocide. And uh, because for recognition of Holodomor as a genocide, it took almost 90 years for European Parliament. And only after the new genocide, the full-scale war, they uh, finally made this decision. Our uh, European Parliament partners uh, in, Bund in German Bundestag, so I think the key is here. What's uh, the blockade of the Black Sea previous year and till uh, summer this year? Weaponization of food is weaponization of hunger. And if 90 years ago Stalin man-made famine was against Ukrainian nation, now weaponization of food is against global South countries because they will be threatening of hunger, lack of grain from Ukraine. And what's happening now in Cambodia, in Vietnam, when we see the hike of price for rice? It's all interconnected. So my question, why people 
uh, need to suffer in global south countries, in Africa, in some Asian countries, because of a uh, totalitarian regime in Kremlin, which nothing changed from Soviet time till now. So actually, we have to finally talk about sustainable peace. And in Ukraine, more than 40 experts, we develop a sustainable peace manifesto with key ideas, punishment for the aggra uh, aggression, and which it included also uh, confiscation of Russian assets, sovereign assets, and we need political will, tribunal and reparations in the future. And second also, it's membership of Ukraine in the EU and NATO, decolonization of Russian history. I can imagine vic what victory means for me. It's not just Ukraine restoring territorial integrity in 1991, internationally recognized borders. It's not just about reparations, because Russian society should also be moral guilty for not protesting against a Russian uh, dictatorship regime, what they are doing. But also, I can imagine one day visiting Moscow and seeing in the Red Square of Moscow the monuments for victims of uh, Soviet genocide against Ukrainians during Holodomor. Also, another memorial to Chechen's uh, people, which were also, remember, First and Second Chechen's War. But it was a genocide against Chechen's people who proclaimed their independence during the disintegration of the Soviet Union. And also, uh, another memorial uh, to the genocide, what Russia is doing now. We have to talk about de-imperialization of Russian uh, Federation. This is the way to go, and actually through economic sanctions, which uh, we are discussing now, 12 uh, package, uh, sanction package of the EU. But I can imagine the influence uh, uh, of this package if this uh, package was done in 2015. Maybe this could help us to prevent the full-scale war or somehow limit Russian uh, capacity to prepare more military and to have this build up with more than 160,000 of troops near Ukrainian, Russian, Ukrainian, Belarusian border in 2021, then 2022 before the full scale invasion. So, uh, 12, 11 sanctions, 11 package of sanctions of the EU, including US sanctions, uh, G7 sanctions against Russia, they are good, but it's not enough to stop aggressive behavior of Russian and to collapse Russian economies that they are not able to produce more weapons. So with sanctions policy, we have to analyze how to make really hellish sanctions when Russia is not able to kill Ukrainians every day. And actually now what's happening, uh, every day we have Syrian uh, on our cell phone numbers. And the number of guided aerial bombs launched by Russia on a daily basis is growing significantly. They, they remotely could use it like 50 kilometers from uh, the uh, um, fighting lines and actually to destroy uh, villages, uh, kill civilians. So Russia adjusted to the war reality and actually managed to produce more weapons with this uh, receiving supply from Iran, North Korea. This is why my uh, questions to the Western nations uh, politicians uh, will be elected, someone re-elected, but the key is the societies we will be living in. And actually, everyone is talking about uh, Ukraine victory, but we cannot sacrifice Ukraine. We need to work together. And what makes me not worry, not angry, but this uh, lack of understanding, this is not Russian war against Ukraine, it's Russian war against Europe. It's genocidal war, it's colonial war, and it's war against NATO. Because if someone wants to say, oh, this is war between uh, Russia against Ukraine, no. I remember some uh, Putin statements before in 2021 one against NATO. And what's happening in the Baltic Sea also, recent uh, special uh, Russian military operation with the communication underwater. So Russia using hybrid warfare to undermine stability. And actually Russia, China, I'm sure that China already investing resources in building infrastructure of alliances like BRICS, Shanghai Organization, investing in Latin America, in Africa, besides Djibouti military bases, everywhere. So one day uh, we will see a 
not surprise attack in Taiwan. We will see that China has this network of organizations, with, including terrorist organizations. This is why, for me, it's very sad that even uh, recognition of Wagner Group as a terrorist organization didn't happen in the US, which is strange. Why? When uh, Wagner Group, with their uh, uh, terrorist activities everywhere, in Mali, in um, other African countries, in Venezuela, in Belarus, in Ukraine, and others, so this is why I think victory of Ukraine is so important for Moldova, actually to restore territorial integrity and bring back Transnistria. It's important to Georgia, because it's about returning back Abkhazia and Ossetia. It's important for Belarus, because this is their chance actually to have, uh, through elections, to have a democratically elected uh, government. It's also important for other nations. But the key is here, especially what's happening now in the Middle East, where is the Western strategy of prevention? Not, oh, we didn't know about this. Now it's everything clear, what's happening? Uh, and I think we have a few more minutes, and uh, for me it's very important to send another message about internal policy of Ukraine, and I guess that when we are talking about democracy and elections in Europe, we also have to, we also hear um, this um, conversation and discussion if, it, if there is a possibility uh, to have election in Ukraine. Uh, and uh, even our partners ask us about that. Uh, will you have presidential election? Will you have a parliament election? Is it possible? Personally, me as a journalist, I see and I talk with uh, many people, politicians. Uh, um, so I, and I see the situation two weeks ago in my uh, in neighboring town of my uh, hometown, where destroyed, not destroyed, but, but at least uh, somehow broken every school uh, and every kindergarten, and uh, usually elections uh, take place in schools. So I have no possibility to have elections in Ukraine during war time because this town is very far from the front line. Uh, but how to to make them safe? How to give people a right to uh, to vote and to be elected? Personally, me think that many uh, those uh, soldiers. Um, uh, who are uh, fighting on the front line have right to be elected. They, they have right to be uh, members of parliament, but there's no possibility to them even to be elected. So what do you think about, about these discussions? I, I'm not asking about if it's possible because I, I don't think so, and even our president uh, already said that. What do you think and what message should be sent to our partners? So Ukraine compared to the aggressor state, always conducted, have been conducted free and fair elections. So according to our constitutions, uh, constitution, during martial law, election is prohibited, it's unconstitutional. So I cannot imagine when Russia daily uh, attacking Ukrainian cities by massive cruise missile, ballistic missile, kamikaze drones. So those who are recommending us to conduct elections, okay guys, come to Ukraine, and work in the uh, election commission without anti-air defense systems enough, uh, without uh, all our like, um, uh, no-fly zone protection and everything. So it's impossible. So my Ukraine, in Russia, it's clear who will be next president. In Ukraine, it's about competition. It's about political competition. It's about voting rights. It's also about... Uh, uh, so it's impossible. It's not just some people say it's about money, we have to find money. Guys, it's not about money, it's about democracy. Really true, free and fair elections during the full-scale war is impossible. So first, victory, and after victory, now our uh, parliament is working on some amendments, how to guarantee for millions of Ukrainians who are living abroad their voting rights, this transition period. We are working, we are preparing, because we are true democracy. We want election, but election free and fair. With uh, our soldiers, their rights not just to vote, but also to run for elections. 
because they are the defenders of our freedom and they have a right to be together with others to compete for uh, being in the offices in the future. And also, um, uh, I think uh, this is a kind of manipulation. And I understand this is part of Russian propaganda to say, okay, if Ukraine uh, do not conduct elections, it means that Ukraine is not a democratic state. So it's a trap. And let's be frank, uh, and uh, I cannot imagine, I, I imagine who is in this interest, because can you imagine if Ukraine starts election and then Russia will start bombing us and then everyone says, look, look, Ukraine is a failed state. They wanted to conduct, but they are not able. So during the war, uh, election is impossible and more than 100 uh, think tanks, civil society representatives, they produce a statement two months ago with all arguments. Why? So my call to all partners, help Ukraine to win faster. Give us everything to need to liberate all our territories. Because it's also questions about people living in the uh, now temporary occupied Crimea, about their rights also to vote. So this is why I really want everyone in Ukraine to be in equal rights to vote. And uh, I think in the history, we've never seen a practical case when country during, even we have the British experience, when they were missing for 10 years elections during the World War II. So why Ukraine should be pushed for first victory? Let's focus on victory first, helping Ukraine with uh, enough uh, attack arms, enough uh, anti-air defense system, enough F-16, that we have air superiority and we could defend the Black Sea from Russian attempt to monopolize the Black Sea. So this is the key and it's not just in the interest of Ukraine, it's in the interest of uh, Romania, Bulgaria, Turkey, Moldova, Georgia and not just because the security of the Black Sea mat uh, matter for uh, Mediterranean countries and uh, globally. So freedom of navigation and actually victory first. Thank you very much. I think we finished. Uh, time is out. Thank you everyone for your attention.